Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. You've probably heard some of this in the news and you're going to hear a lot more of it uh, coming up soon, but um, there's going to be a big push to make changes to Social Security and Medicare, sometimes called our old age entitlement programs. Um, the proximate reason, there's no real proximate reason for this push, but because Republicans now control the House, they can hold various things hostage, uh, including the debt limit, including budgets, and as part of holding that hostage, uh, it seems like they want to uh, try to cut Social Security and Medicare. And in doing so, the main thing that you hear a lot uh, about it is that they want to change the, that they want to increase the retirement age. Um, so let's look here on the Washington Post. This was from a couple days ago. Their plan would raise Medicare eligibility to age 67 while allowing for more private sector plans, while lifting Social Security to age 70 for younger workers and changing the way benefits are calculated. Um, that's a, not a well-written sentence, but <clears throat> we'll take it as it is. So right now, uh, if you're retiring today, the quote-unquote full retirement age is age 67. And the idea is we'll raise that to 68 or 69 or even to 70, um, and that will uh, help uh, reduce spending on old age benefits. Now, I think that this uh, way of talking about what they're doing is highly misleading uh, and I think, in fact, a lot of analysis about it, even critical analysis of it, doesn't really understand what's being talked about here. So usually when people want to critique this um, change, what they will say is something like, oh, it's basically a cut, right? If you, if you move the uh, retirement age from 67 to 70, then that means that people have to work three years longer. And that, and that means that they forego three years of benefits, three years of benefits. And then they'll go further and say, and look, since poor people don't live as long as rich people, then it's really very regressive because those three years are a lot or much higher share of the retirement years of poor people than for rich people and so on and so forth. And that's all, I, you know, I mean, that's, that's all well intended. You know, the critiques are all well intended. I don't mean to, and I used to think this too. I used to think this is what was talk, being talked about as well. But this is not what's being talked about. The full retirement age is not like something you have to achieve in order to um, uh, retire. Uh, the Social Security has 96 retirement ages between age 62 and 70. Every month between age 62 and 70 is a retirement age, meaning you can go to the Social Security Administration, you can say, hey, I want a retirement, you declare, I want to retire, you declare that, and then depending on what month between those 96 months you retire, you get different amounts of benefits. So what's really going on here, and I'll get into this a little bit in depth, is not so much a cut in, it's not so much that they're going to make people work more, it's just they're going to reduce your benefits. Like the amount of monthly benefit you get at any given time when you retire um, is just going to be less than it is today. It's just a cut. And the reason I, don't, the reason I say it's very misleading is precisely for what I just went across just, just a few minutes ago, right? No one thinks about it as like, oh, they just want to cut benefits by like 20% or 30% or, or 15%, whatever. Instead of just saying, hey, this is a 20% benefit cut, it's a raise in the retirement age, which means you work long, and that's just, not, that's just not accurate. So anyways, I thought it might be fun to go through like a little, a little how-to, a little, a little, not tutorial per se, but a little explanation of how Social Security benefits actually work and how your benefit is calculated, and then that'll help us understand what it actually means to increase the retirement age, okay? So let's start with this example here. Um, this is an individual's wage record. This is a hypothetical individual. And what I do is I have this individual uh, at age 20, entering the workforce at age 20 in year 1976. And I go ahead and I give them a wage of $10,000 in 1976. That's their nominal pay. That's how much you know they got. Not adjusted for inflation, nothing like that. That's what their paycheck said that year. And then I just kind of gave them a 5% raise every year all the way to the end. Obviously, in real life, you know, people's incomes are not so stable as this, but this will do for our purposes here, okay? So, what we do to figure out your benefit is, you know, first, let's look at all these wages. So, 
you see they have all these wages going down and down and down as their ages go up and up and up. And then here we're going to say that they're retiring at age 67, which is the full retirement age right now. And th thankfully for our purposes, they're retiring in 2023, which is also this year, right? So this is their full wage record, right? All of these wages, they paid 12.4% tax on these wages throughout their life, right? We could even do a little math here, right? Let's see. This is not adjusted for inflation, right? Just their nominal tax. And this includes uh, the employer side and the employee side tax. Um, so over the course of their, um, you know, of these years, what, what is this, 40... Six years over the course of these 46 years, they pay $220,000 in Social Security tax. Okay. Anyways, before we start calculating what their monthly benefit's going to be, the first thing we got to do is we got to convert these wages over here, their nominal wages, into a, a different wage that is adjusted for the growth in average wages, right? So every year, the Social Security Administration will put out the average wage for the year. So we see here, it's called the average wage index, okay? And this is just what it seems, right? The average wage in 1951, at least the taxable Social Security wage like that's relevant to these calculations, was apparently right about $2,800. This is in nominal dollars. And then, you know, last year it was $60,000. Again, nominal, not inflation adjusted at all. So all we're gonna do to get to adjust their actual wage to an AWI adjusted wage, a wage adjusted for the average wage index, is we're gonna take the value of the average wage index at age 60 for the individual. So here, that's this one, right? Because they turned age 60 here. This is the average wage when they turned age 60. We're gonna take that amount and we're gonna divide it by the AWI value in any given year. So for the first year, we're gonna take 48,642 and divide it by 9,226. In fact, I'll go ahead and do that here just to show you what it looks like. Okay, so four, so we're just taking that and we're dividing it by that. And that gets us 5.2 whatever, right? So then we'll take that 5.2 and we'll just multiply it by the average wage, by the actual wage you had and you see this is your AWI adjusted wage, right? Which I have here as well, 5270. And I've gone ahead and done that for every single value here. So this is your, the AWI adjusted wage of this person for every single year. Um, okay, so we start with that. So then the next thing we're gonna do, oh, and then notice here, they have a rule, it's kind of a strange rule, but after age 60, after age 60, they just put in your nominal wage. So they stop making these AWI adjustments. After age 60, you just get your nominal wage, put it in, is, is your AWI adjusted wage, right? They just don't make the adjustment anymore. So for 61, 62, all the way through 66, we just copy your nominal wage right over. Okay. Now the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna need to find this value here, your average index monthly earnings, okay? Um, and I don't know if they explain it here. This average summarizes up to 35 years of a worker's indexed earnings. Uh, basically what you do is you take the top 35 values from this list. So this person worked for 46 years. So we'll take the top 35 years of those 46 years using the AWI adjusted wage. Um, so I've done that down here, and we'll, we'll take an average of it, okay? And that'll get our, like an, an annual amount, okay? So this, this is that amount, so it's like 59.194. You can see that there, okay. That was their AWI, their average AWI adjusted wage of their top 35 years of earnings, okay? And then we'll take that and divide that by 12, and that'll get their That'll get us their average index monthly earnings, their AIME, okay? 
And when I say top 35 years, you know, what, what that also means, therefore, is that this calculation ignores, for this person, 11 years of earnings. We don't count that into our calculation at all. If you had less than 35 years of earnings, let's say you had 25 years of earnings, 25 years of earnings would still make you eligible for benefits. But what they would do is they would take your 25 years of earnings, your, of your AWI adjusted earnings, and then they would add in 10 zeros. So they'd be, they would be like, well, for these other 10 years, we're gonna, you, you earn zero dollars, right? And then that would go into the average, okay? In this case, the person has, has at least 35 years, so we don't need to add in any zeros. But those zeros would drag down your AWI adjusted wage, right? Anyways, we get the average index monthly earnings, the AIME for this particular individual. Again, this person is retiring. Well, we'll get into that in a minute, okay? Okay, so we've got that. Then, once we've got their AIME, we're going to apply this uh, primary insurance amount formula, the PIA formula. The PIA formula is set right here. So for the first 90%, or excuse me, for the first $1,115 of AIME, we multiply 90%. So essentially, you're going to get a replacement of 90% of your first $1,115 of earnings. From there, it, any amount of your AIME that exceeds 115 but is less than 6721, we're going to multiply that by 32%. So for that chunk of your AIME, you get 32% replacement, right? For the first 1,115 1, of your AIME, you get 90% replacement. For this next amount, Right here, you get 32% replacement. And then for any amount of your AIME that exceeds 6721, you get 15% replacement. So you see it's a kind of graduated replacement. 90% of the first chunk, 32% of the next chunk, and then 15% of whatever remains, okay? Now, uh, in this case, this person, uh, you know, they're in the middle. They don't ever get above 6721. So we basically just take 90% of 1,115, 1, and then we take this 32% of the difference between 1,115 and 4,933. <laughs> we add that together. And this is their primary insurance amount, their PIA, right? $2,225, okay? Now you might say, oh, okay, so that's what they're gonna get each month. Every month they'll get $2,225. That's primary insurance amount, right? Uh, not so fast, right? So this is where the retirement age comes in. If you retire at the full retirement age, which right now is 67, but they're saying they wanna increase to seven, 70. If you, require at the f if you retire at the full retirement age, then yes, you will get $2,225 a month. That will be your payment. But remember, the full retirement age is one of 96 retirement ages because you can retire any month between your 62nd birthday and your 70th birthday. You have 96 different retirement windows. The full retirement age is one of those 96 retirement windows. So the question becomes, what happens if you retire in one of the other 95 windows? And the answer is that they... Essentially, if you retire before the full retirement age, you receive less than this amount, less than the PIA. And if you retire after it, you receive more than the PIA, right? So the full retirement uh, age is nothing but a like placeholder that then determines how much money you get at all the retirement ages. So how much do you get reduced if you... Um, if you retire before the full retirement age. And for this, we'll go to the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR, uh, what is this? Uh, CFR uh, 2404.410. <laughs> All right. Um, here we go. How does SSA reduce my old age benefits if I retire early? You see? The reduction is based on the number of months of entitlement prior to the month you attain the full retirement age. The reduction is five-ninths of 1% for each of the first 36 months and five-twelfths of 1% for each month in excess of 36, right? So we take the month that is your full retirement age. In this case, it's right at your 67th birthday, whatever month that is, okay? And for the 36 months prior to that, if you retire anywhere in those, those 36 windows, 
what we're going to do is we're going to take the distance between the month you retired and the month of your full retirement age, which again would be your, your, your birth month at age 67, right? And we'll just multiply that by five ninths of 1%, right? So if you uh, retire 10 months early, we'd take 10 months times five ninths of 1%, and that'll tell us how much to reduce it. If you, if you retire more than 36 months early, right? More than three months early, so maybe at age 62, your first chance you can do it, for the amount beyond 36 months that you retire early, they reduce it by five uh, twelfths of 1% for each month. Okay, And then if you retire later, which right now uh, you can do because you can retire anywhere between 62 and 70 and the full retirement age is 67. Now, notably, if they go all the way up to 70, you, there is no later retirement age. But if you retire later, you get these delayed retirement credits. Okay, And those are uh, somewhat more easily calculated as two-thirds of 1% of your full retirement age benefit. Right, So if you retire one month after your full retirement age, instead of getting 100% of the PIA, right here, this PIA, instead of getting 100% of the PIA, you will get 100 point, what, you would get what? 100.66667%. Does that make sense? Um, if you retired three months after it, you would get 102% of the full retirement amount, right? So when you put this all together, you can see here in this graph, and I'll hide my head just in case I'm uh, causing problems for you here. I don't think I am, but as you can see here, this is really what it looks like, right? So if we take age 67 right now, this is the percent of Social Security primary insurance amount you will receive by age of retirement for different full retirement ages, right? So we just take, you know, um, we take those percentages that you get more or less than the full retirement amount, um, and we just kind of put it on a nice little graph here, right? So right now, this is what it looks like at age 67. At age 67, you get 100% of the primary insurance amount. So let's look at that. So if you retire right at age 67 and you're this person that we talked about before, you would get 100% of the primary insurance amount, which of course is $2,225, okay? Now let's say you retire uh, a year early. Um, in fact, let's actually go all the way down to 62 because that's the first time you could retire, right? If you retire at 62, what we'll do is you'll, we'll, we'll give you 70% of your primary insurance amount. So I'm just going to take this amount and I'm going to multiply it by 70, right? 0.70, okay? So if you retired at 62, instead of getting 2,225, which is 100% of your primary insurance amount, you would get 1,558, which is 80% of your primary insurance amount. And so the difference there is $668. That's how much less you would receive each month in this like old age annuity um, thing. So what they do when they increase the retirement age, it, again, it's not that you now have to work until you're 68. Like let's say they go from uh, a full retirement age of 67, which is what this red line looks like, to a full retirement age of 68, which is what this black line looks like. You can still retire at age 67. In fact, you can retire at age 62, 63. You can retire at any of the 96 retirement windows right? There's 96 retirement windows. You can retire at any one of those. It doesn't change that. What it does is it just moves this line down, right? So now when you retire at 67, instead of getting 100% of the primary insurance amount, you get 93% of the retire, the, um, you get 93% of the primary insurance amount, which in this case is $2,069 for a reduction of $156. So when they say, if someone were to say to you, I think we should increase the retirement age to 68, all they are saying is they think essentially that at any point when you retire, at any of those 96 windows that you choose to retirement, retire, they want your benefit to be 7% less than it is now. They just want to cut your benefit by 7%. Across the board, across the board. Look, the black line trails the red line across the board. And this is rough. It's roughly 7%. You can see all the numbers up here, actually, um, for the different ages, uh, 7, 6.7, 6.3, 7. But it's, on average, it's about a 7% cut at every, at every age, right? That's what they're wanting to do, right, is to cut it. Now, if they're going to go all the way to 70, let's look what that looks like. Instead of uh, getting 100% of the primary insurance amount at age 67, 
you now get 100% of the primary insurance amount at age 70, which means let's hold it steady and say, let's say you continue to retire at age 67, what's going to happen to you? You're only going to get 80% of the primary insurance amount. So let's plug that in. So now instead of getting 2,225 for retiring at age 67, you get 1,780, which is a decline of $445 a month. Let's go ahead and just annualize that. $5,340. They want to cut your annual benefit by $5,340. That's it. That's it. They just want to take the amount you're getting right now for every $100 you're getting right now at any one of the ages, at any one of the ages, and cut it by $20. Cut it by 20%. That's it. That's the whole thing. It's not you have to work more. That's not what it is. It's just a, just a straight up cut. And it's frustrating because this is calculable. It's not like, you know, this math is all that difficult. I showed you how to do it. I showed where you can get the numbers from the CFR. You can do the spreadsheet. This is something you can do. But every single newspaper article that's going to be written on this is just going to be like, they're just going to increase the age. The the age is going to go up. The age is going to go up. And people are not going to process what is otherwise a very simple proposal, which is if your proposal is to go from the full retirement age being 67 to the full retirement age being 70, all you're doing is saying, I want to cut benefits by 20%. I want people to have 20% less benefit each each month, each year in retirement. 20% less cash. I think old people should have less income. Precisely speaking, I want them to have 20% less income, at least of this kind of income. Obviously, you can have other kinds of income in old age, but that's it. That's the whole thing, okay? Now, before I close here, I wanted to show you a little bit of thing here, right? Because one thing I, th- I think um, people struggle with when talking about this is I think there's an intuition that, hey, when, when life expectancy is increasing, um, then of course we're gonna have a more, more of the population is gonna be over 65. Let's say like holding all else equal and blah, 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 right? So you're gonna have a higher percentage of your population that's retired. And you might say, well, look, if life expectancy is increasing, like we don't necessarily want, you know, 50, 60, you know, we don't want an endless amount of our population to be retired. We need a certain amount working and all this kind of stuff. And there's this idea that, hey, if life expectancy goes from like say 60 to 80, which it has, I think, over the last, you know, 100 years or something like that, then, you know, people really need to be working like 20 more years than they used to, right? So maybe before you would retire at age, I don't know, if before you had to retire at age 65, if like life expectancy increased by 12 years or whatever, maybe you should have to work an extra five years. And I think what this misses is just because life expectancy is up, it's not this, that, does not, that does not also mean that people who are 70 uh, are like physically capable of working, that they have a high capacity for labor, right? 70 might be the new 50 in like life expectancy terms, but 70 is not the new 50 in terms of like robustness and vitality and ability to get up and do work every day and, on, and, and you know, bear that physical toll. I don't, I don't know if anyone knows any elderly people here. <laughs> I, I have uh, elderly parents. I have elderly grandparents. They, I mean, my mom, maybe she's 62. She could work some, but my dad really, you know, he was a physical manual laborer his whole life. His ability to work, I think, at this point is very limited. And my grandparents are... So, like, it's just... I think people misunderstand the degree to which you can't just say, put them to work, right? There are some, like, latent hours among retired people. There are some retired people, especially some people retire in their late 50s or whatever. There are people out there in the retired population who could pump more hours into into the labor force if you, like, really wanted to do that. I don't know. I'm not really all that hot on that myself. But it's not like an unlimited amount. It's not like, well, hey, everyone's living to 80 now, so we can all work until we're seven. We can't all work until we're seven. People's bodies are breaking down, right? That's why we have retirement in the first place. It's not just like there's something special about people who are old. It's that people who are old have a diminished capacity to work. It is, in a, in a real way, a kind of like extra simple disability benefit, right? It's a recognition that as you're getting older, you're starting to become more disabled, as a group, but we're all going to be there, and that's why we ever touch. So, I wanted to try to demonstrate this a little bit with a little bit of uh, data. Um, I'm not going to do like a full d- data tutorial on this, but 
I'm going to show, I'm going to use the uh, annual social and economic supplement from uh, the uh, Census Bureau. This is uh, the March CPS. I've talked about it in other ones. Nor, and I think in all the other uh, tutorials, I've always used the uh, IPUMS data file. I don't actually use the IPUMS data file that much. I normally use this file directly from the census. So I'm going to use that here. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to show you how disability rates change as people get older. So we can see that as people are getting older, it's not just like a smooth ride, like, oh, no, no problem. Just put the 70-year-olds to work, you know? The 70-year-olds, they're more, they're disabled, you know? <laughs> Even the ones who don't show up as like, literally they, when the survey taker calls them and is like, are you disabled? Even a lot of them who are, who probably say, no, I'm good, you know, I'm not that disabled. Again, if you've ever dealt with elderly people, they, 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 they will say that, but their capacity to work, even if they're maybe not officially disabled, is, is quite diminished. So I think we can at least start to get a whiff of this. Okay. So for this, this is the 2022 March supplement. So they would ask people in March of 2022, they would ask them questions about the year 2021, what you were doing in year 2021. So we're going to go into the data. You, you, know, you download these files here. You can get the C CSV. That's what I've got. You can get the ASCII file, which is a fixed width file. Um, anyways, we'll go into the data dictionary here. Um, should I bring my head back? Let me bring my head back. Okay. All right. So what we're looking to do here, let me check out what I got going on over here. This is a little script I wrote. So you download this, the, uh, the data file, which is here. I think I have this one. You download this. And then this is the data dictionary. This data dictionary is going to tell you what all the variables are and, and therefore how to calculate certain things. So what we want to do first thing first is we want to figure out the age. All right, so this is the age variable. It's just A underscore age. So in the CSV file, the first row will have a column that says A underscore age. And all of the uh, numbers that are in that column, like going down, are going to be the age of that particular survey respondent. So when we go in here, um, the way I'm going to grab age is I'm just going to grab it right here, A age. Right. So for every record in the file, we're going to grab their age. Um, and, and as you can see here, the values are 0 to 79 for the first 79 years of age. So anyone from the age 0 to 79, they just have their literal age in there. If you're between 80 to 84, all those people are just given the age 80. And then if you're 85 or above, all those people are just given the age 85. And the reason they do this is for uh, privacy purposes, right? There aren't that many people who are above these ages. And so by collapsing, you know, them into smaller, you know, by making everyone between the ages of 80, 80 and 84 represented by 80, then you can make it harder to figure out who the people in the surveys are if you were trying to do like de-anonymization, which they really, uh, they don't like you to do. Um, okay, so we're going to do that. And then we also have the weight. Um, all right, so for that's we use the March supplemental weight, uh, the ASEC supplemental weight. It's called Mars sup weight. So you can see here, I grab it here by using uh, this uh, little, um, little function um, that I write. Um, I'm not going to go over that, but that's the weight. So for each line, we grab their weight and we grab their age. Now notice the weight has two implied decimals. So when we're going to try to print out the weight later on, if we want to print out the literal weight of the person, we're going to divide by 100. Uh, weight, again, is how many people that person represents in the overall population. We need weight in order to make sure the final result is representative of the entire population. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, create uh, two little uh, dictionaries. we got a population dictionary, which I call POP, and a disability dictionary, which I call disability. Um, I'm going to go through uh, numbers 0 through 80, and I'm going to set these dictionaries equal to 0 uh, for all of the ages. So I'm basically just creating these counters. Um, and uh, for each age, I'm going to go ahead and say population for age 0 is 0. Disability for age zero is zero. And then as we go through the second time, it'll be population for age one is zero. Disability for age one is zero. And we'll do that all the way from zero to 80. Okay. Now, there are a lot of disability variables in the file uh, that do different kinds of things. The one that's sort of most literally on point is this variable right here. Um, dis underscore HP. And they just ask... Uh, 
Does this person have a health problem or disability which prevents work or which limits the amount, the kind or amount of work? Again, this is a question they ask the person. Do you have a disability that prevents you from working or that limits the amount of work you do? So it's up to them to give an answer. Um, the universe here is all persons age 15 plus. For, so, so for kids between the ages of 0 and 14, this question is not asked. So they're all, all those kids are just going to have a value of zero. NIU means not in universe, right? They're not in the universe of survey uh, takers uh, that are of survey respondents that are asked this. Okay, so what I'm going to do is as I loop through all the records, I'm going to add up all the population here. And then I'm going to say if the person, if this HP for this person is equal to one, which means yes, then go ahead and add them to the disability counter. And then when we get to the bottom here, I'm going to print basically the number of people who wind up in the disability counter, their weight, divided by the number of people who wind up in the population counter, their weight. And then that'll give us a percent. That'll give us a percent of people who are disabled at that particular age. All right. So let's run the script and see what that looks like. Uh, duh, duh, duh. All right, so we'll get an age, and then we'll get a percentage. And the percent is how many people are disabled at that age, how many people reported that I have a work-limiting disability um, when the census taker asked them. Okay, wonderful. So remember, 0 to 14, we're going to get 0% because they're not in the universe. None of those people were even asked the question. At 15, some disability pop. Dis disability pops into existence uh, and we get 2%. So at the youngest age, only 2% of people are saying, yeah, I have a health problem or disability that prevents my work or limits the amount or kind of work. Only 2% of people at age 18 are saying that, or at age 15 are saying that. At age 19, we go to 4%. So now we're, these are people who are out of, out of high school now. They're kind of at least possibly able to work and we're only at 4% at that age. Now, as we get older, Right at 37% have a work limiting disability. At 50, 10% have a work limiting disability. At 60, 16% have a work limiting disability. At 65, uh, I guess the highest amount here, what we get in the mid 60s, we get all the way up to 18%. Now, here's the funny thing as you get over age. Over the hump here, the percentage of people saying they have a work-limiting disability actually starts to decline, right? So right, right as we're heading up to retirement, right? 62 is the first age you can retire with Social Security. So right as we head up to retirement, the age right before retirement, the first age you can retire is the highest value in the file. 18% of people at age 61 say they have a work-limiting disability. Then as soon as retirement kicks in, these people start retiring, and not everyone's retiring yet, so you still have some amounts. But after people retired, they start saying they're not dis they don't have work-limiting disabilities anymore, which is interesting. Um, I think partially it makes sense if they say, well, I'm not, I don't have a work-limiting disability because there's no work that I am limited from. I'm retired. Um, but anyways, we see a kind of a, a weird thing where disability falls off a past retirement, which doesn't really make sense, right? Um, but whatever, the point remains, these folks are getting disabled. And even people who are not saying they have a work-limiting disability, you know, like th th some of them do, <laughs> you know, they might just not want to admit it. Okay. So we have uh, another way to approach this then. Uh, so here is uh, another variable here, um, uh, PR dis flag. Does this person have any of these disability conditions? One is yes, two is no. Um, and what does it mean, any of these disability conditions? So they ask a bunch of disability questions here, um, one by one, right? Do you have difficulty dressing or bathing? Right, and you can say yes or no. Is this person deaf or do they have serious difficulty hearing? Yes or no. Blind? Yes or no. Um, do they have difficulty doing errands alone because of some, a mental or physical condition? Yes or no. Do they have an ambulatory disability, difficulty walking? Yes or no. Um, do they have problems remembering things? Yes or no. So if they have any of those, this variable, which is like the disability flag, 
this variable will be set equal to one, right? So this is a good way to, you don't have to go through all of those variables. You just say, if they have any of them, this one's gonna be hit um, at one. Now notice these are like serious disabilities, you know? Um, it's always serious difficulty. So it's not any difficulty, it's serious difficulty. Anyways, let's use that instead of uh, the variable we were using, right? Which is the one that just says, do you have a work limiting disability? Um, and this one might be better because the work limiting disability one, like I said, there's a little bit of uncertainty. What the hell does that mean if I'm retired? I'm not being limited from work by my disability. I'm retired. But this one is, you know, we don't have that same problem, you know, because we're just asking you, do you have vision problems or problems walking or whatever, right? All right. So now we get a slightly um, uh, more compelling uh, numbers here, right? So again, Below the age of 15, they don't ask anyone, so we get 0%. And we get higher amounts now, because sometimes people have these disabilities, but they're maybe not work-limiting, or at least they don't believe that they're work-limiting. So at 15, we have 6% of the population that's disabled, same at 19. Um, but then let's see what, as we move on. It's still, it's pretty low throughout here. Uh, at 52, we get up to 10%. At 60, we get to 70%. Right at 67, the f the full retirement age right now, we get to 20 percent, and then it just keeps going. You know, 25 percent at age 75, at age 80, which include at age 79, right? We get 34 percent at age 80, which remember includes um, everyone above the age of 80. It's it's over half, right? So again, like disability is starting to get real serious at these ages. And so the extent to which you can just push them out, push these people out into the workforce is limited. You, you know, it's limited. Their capacity is declining. That's, that's what it is to go into old age, okay? All right, so one more calculation here. Uh, we did the, these two variables, right? Um, DISP and PRS, PR disc flag. But we also have these other variables here. And these are uh, slightly less um, clear. Not clear, but they're just different, okay? So one thing they ask people is they say, how many weeks did you work last year and how many weeks were you looking for work last year? And then if those values don't equal 52, they say, well, okay, what the hell did you do with the other weeks then, right? <laughs> you either were looking for work or you were in work or you were doing something else. So what was that something else? And one of the answers you can give is that I was ill or disabled right? I was ill or disabled during those extra weeks. And then you could do the same thing here. This is for people who didn't work at all last year. And they say, why didn't you work? What's the main reason? And you can answer ill or disabled, ill or disabled. Okay. And then what else do we have? We have, uh, did you get any kind of disability uh, uh, benefits? This is not including uh, social security. Um, so here we go. Other than Social Security, did you receive any income in 2000 as a result of health problems? And you can answer yes or no, right? So that's a disability benefit. And these are the kinds of things they're talking about. Workers' comp, a union or company disability plan, a U.S. military disability plan, railroad disability plan, black lung, right? These are the sort of your options for non-Social Security disability income, okay? All right, so we got that. And then we have, of course, the Social Security um, we have the Social Security disability income. So if you get Social Security and you say, yes, survey taker, I have Social Security, they say, why were you getting Social Security? What was one of the reasons you were getting them? And one of the answers is that you were disabled, right? And then, you, and then they say, is there a second reason you're getting Social Security? Because you could, in theory, get multiple Social Security benefits. And one of the options is I'm disabled, right? And then SSI, Supplemental Security Income, same kind of idea, but it's means tested. It's if, you don't, if you're not eligible for normal Social Security, they have the same kind of question here. And they say, if you got it, you say, yes, survey taker, I received SSI last year. And then they say, why? And you can say, I was disabled. Or you can say blind. They distinguish disabled and blind here um, because uh, the program is actually different based on whether you were disabled or blind. The benefit amounts are different, uh, believe it or not. Uh, it's the fucking weirdest thing in the world. I think even the asset tests are different. Um, our welfare state is, is a fucking train wreck. Um, and you can do it here, disabled or blind. So what I did to kind of try to like, let's, let's, let's throw it all, let's throw the whole kitchen sink here. As I just said, 
what if you kind of show up as disabled under any of these things, right? If you showed up as this right here, you said, yeah, I have one of these serious difficulties with, you know, hearing or dressing or whatever. If you show up and you say, yeah, I have a work limiting disability. If you say one of the, the reason you didn't work all of last year is because you were disabled or ill, or the reason you didn't work at all is because you were disabled or ill, or yes, I got disability benefits, but not social security disability benefits, or yeah, I got social security disability, or I got got SSI disability. If you said any of that shit, let's go ahead and throw you in and count you as disabled, okay? And then let's see what that looks like. This is kind of, you know, the most comprehensive, I guess you could get. Like let, anyone who registers any kind of disability in, in one way or another, let's throw them in the, let's throw them in here. Um, all right, the numbers don't vary all that much as we see again below 15 they're just not even in the universe they're not counted now we're starting to get some numbers here even at age 15 you got eight percent of people who are disabled in some one sense or another um either they're receiving benefits or they're claiming that's not why they're not working or whatever um okay so whatever at age 40 we got 11 percent who show up as disabled under this measure 50 it's up to 15 percent at age 60 is 25 percent one in four right? At age 65, 67, we're at one in four, right? So people are starting to retire. That's where I think you might see a little bit of a, a dip. Um, at age 75, 31%, one in three are disabled. At age 70, it's still one in four. Um, and then at, at age 80, which includes all ages above the age of 80, it's 52%, right? So the point in all of that is just that these folks are disabled. <laughs> like, you know, it's not just like, oh, cool, people get to have some time off, or do they not? And we need to ask ourselves a question. You know, how much do we want to encourage people to have time off? How much do we want to pay in tax so that old folks can have a have a good time in their in their elder years? Maybe spend some time traveling or spend some time with kids. And and it's just you know, it's just a calculation we have to make. And you know, as people are getting older, yeah, all right, you know, and s instead of you know. Maybe you'll you'll retire a little bit later, but you'll still have 10 years of retirement or 15 years of retirement, you know? And you'll get the same amount of retirement, but since you're living longer, you do need to retire later, right? And it's all good, no problem. And what that misses, again, is that as people get older, there's just an objective decline in their capacity to work. And I think you see this very well in this, uh, in this ASEC file. It, you run up against a real hard line here and people are gonna suffer. You start saying, hey, if you retire at 67, we're going to cut your benefit by 20% relative to the status quo. What? Well, I mean, you know, folks who have disability, they may not even have a great earnings record. Like, what do you, you know, there's going to be a lot of suffering from this. It's not just, ah, oh, I'm going to have to lose a couple years of retirement. Ah, gosh dang it. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to work a little bit longer. It's not that. It's a cut in your benefit, and to the extent that people are unable to survive on that lower benefit amount, and they do try to work longer, many of them are not going to be able to work longer because they have these disabilities. So, I, I don't know. I mean, I would say, you know, if you look at it, I don't include it here, but, you know, the amount of old age benefits we uh, pay for in the U.S. as a percent of, you know, our GDP is not excessive relative to the OECD. Not at all. It's right there. Um, so I don't really see any reason for doing this at this moment. Um, and I will add as a kind of final thing here, it's important to remember that Social Security is not the only way that we provide essentially ta uh, tax-funded benefits, if you will, to old people. We also have this parallel private retirement system with uh, individual retirement accounts and 401ks that we provide a tremendous amount of public subsidy through in the form of tax breaks. And that parallel private system is overwhelmingly uh, participated in by the rich. Like lower class and middle class people have very relatively small amounts of money in the private retirement system, the IRAs and the 401ks. The large share of those assets are held by the very rich and a large share of those tax breaks are, are taken by the very rich. Um, and so, 
and we spend about we spend about a trillion a year on social security which includes disability which includes old age and survivors insurance we spend about a trillion a year on that we spend about 300 billion a year just on the private retirement accounts by providing tax breaks to people who contribute to IRAs and 401ks and that amount v- massively benefits the rich way more benefits the rich than social security does right and so if you if you want to get into the game of starting to cut 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 Let's start cutting some of those tax breaks for the private retirement system, which overwhelmingly benefit the rich. Let's start there. And then when we're, we're happy with what we've accomplished over there, then start moving over to Social Security if you want to, right? But the private retirement accounts are like not even in the, they're not even in the discussion. The, the retirement age for IRAs and 401ks is 59 and a half years old. It's way before 62, which is the first year you can get Social Security, and certainly way below 67, which is the first year that you can get, you, which is your full retirement age, and going to be way below 70, right? So we have this parallel private retirement system that is overwhelmingly subscribed to by the rich, where we're spending $300 billion a year subsidizing their IRA and 401k accounts, and they already have a retirement age that's 59 and a half instead of 67, and we're not even, it's not even on the table, no one's even discussing that. It's like it doesn't even exist. So, anyways, subscribe, comment, uh, give me the thumbs up, all that kind of stuff. I got more more stuff coming. Let's let's try to avoid uh, let's try to avoid you know uh, uh, starving the starving the olds in the next few uh, months as we as we work through policy. Let's try to avoid that if we can. <laughs>